Welcome to the Beauties Podcast, where we talk about everything you need to know about women's sports. From the grassroots to the pros, we got it all. Today on the show, Dr. Leslie Tugood joins us to normalize the conversation around mental health in sports. Here are your hosts, Addie and Cowie. Welcome to the Beauty Sports Desk this week. We've got a we've got a big episode this week and as I sit here beside you, Cowie, I I just feel this sense of gratitude and appreciation because one of the things that we talked about in the very beginning with Beauty Sports is we want to come in here, we want to have really good real conversations and we're not going to shy away from hard conversations and I feel like we did a decent job at that today we went right at it yeah we did and you know quite honestly there's a lot of our conversations that if we had a record button probably there would be some interest to listen to because Mm -hmm. we do spend a lot of our time um, being pretty open, candid, and honest with each other, mm-hmm. which is why I love you so much, my friend. Um, but yeah, we got an opportunity to do that with um, a professional who has spent countless hours across multiple sports, both genders, doesn't matter. Um, it was a fun one. It was a fun one. And for the people listening in and tuning in, it is Mental Health Awareness Month, and but we're just chatting about it today, and we felt like it was a really good opportunity to just sit back and, and have, we know we have a lot of listeners that are parents or kids or whoever that listens to the show, and it is becoming more and more and more important that we talk about these things and make it a part of, you know, having an athlete and and honestly, the way we talk about sports and the the terms that we use and, you know, just having more really good conversations about how it impacts um, kids and like athletes overall in sports, right? Yeah. Like I think that, well, what we learned today and what we've been talking about. So you and Addie and I coach a spring hockey team. Shout out to any of the girls who are listening. Hey, yo. What up? Um, and we are making a, a very much a concerted effort in our room to have those conversations and, and to create that safe space. We've played multiple sports. We're all very comfortable having chalk talks and video sessions and practices and spending time in a gym and and all of these things. And one thing that in my time in sport that has never been prioritized is, is a focus or a focus session or, um, an established route or way as an athlete that you know that your mental health is important, that the people around you care and that you have support. And one thing for me, like, Looking back and doing this episode, we've gone down a some rabbit holes, yeah, some rabbit holes, and a stroll down memory lane, and all these different things. But at the end of the day, sports is sports is a huge part of a lot of people's lives. But you want to walk away from sports feeling like people got to know you as a human being. Mm-hmm. And I feel like in some situations, and definitely in in my career for sure, um, that was second. That was secondary towards what you produce, what your value is. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 tide is changing where um, you have to care about the kid. You have to care about the athlete to get the most out of them. You have to. Oh, yeah. I remember I could give you a handful of times in my life. And it's like we, we say rabbit hole. We say memory lane. It's like triggering. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's neither of those half decently nice words um, where you felt I felt the weight of a team because you very clearly knew that the expectation for you was to whether it was, um, you know, hit the home run or um, score the goal or Mm -hmm. whatever sport it was that you knew it was Mm -hmm. evident that your value or your perceived value from those around you was by your athletic abilities, not by the who you were. Yeah. And, oh God. Yeah. You're, you're triggering is a good word. You are correct because it's, you know, I could even, I could even go, I can go down so many different lanes with this conversation. But for me, like, I know you were super academic and you enjoyed school and stuff like that. But my, my value came from sports within people. And I think there's a sense of me that 
didn't even try in school because it's not even where I got the attention, Mm -hmm. you know, and I can see that in, in some kids, like, why would I care about certain things when this is where I'm getting all the attention? And it's like, we need to dig deeper than that within. And, and as coaches and as parents recognize that as you're getting a lot of attention here, but what, what's going on? Like you still have to be involved in, in life. This isn't the only thing. And I think you can get wrapped up in that pretty quickly. Yeah. So we talked to, talked to Dr. Tugid today, just about being a high performance athlete, or I call it a high achiever because that's, I guess, how I think of myself. Um, you're right. I was a, a good student. I'm still, I'm doing my MBA right now. Mm-hmm. Why? Cause it's a challenge. <laughs> and I like to challenge my brain and I've told people I trust my brain more than almost anything else. Uh, <clears throat> um, and I was a, a fairly decent athlete and I have had to check myself in my adult life of that high achiever perfectionist mentality, mm-hmm. um, both in my expectations of those around me. Uh, and I've had to have, like some hard checks on myself mm-hmm. based on that. And I've had to look in the mirror a few times and say like, it is okay um, it's okay to not be perfect (laughs) quite honestly, but we've chased for so long the high of winning or, or being the best or being praised for these things that it becomes an inherently who you are. And I think that, yeah, we can do a better job as a society to support kids in and understanding that about themselves at an earlier age and how to digest and deal with, um, pushing themselves and, and the good things that come from pushing yourself, but making sure that we do it in a healthy way. And that's the key thing right there is doing it in a healthy way. Because on this podcast, we talk about everything um, when it comes to women, sports and, mm-hmm. and you know that kind of thing. And there was a study that came out that a lot of CEOs are women that played in sports because they have that drive. They have that competitive nature. Yep. But there there is the healthy aspect of it too. It can't control your life. It can't be the one and only thing that you care about. And at a really young age, we talk a lot about grassroots. And I think that that's where a lot of the value comes from. And the terms that we use with kids is so important. Hugely. Because how many times have you heard in your life like, oh, well, I only got two goals today. Mm -hmm. So I sucked. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I got four the day before. Yeah, it's like we are immediately creating value systems within kids at like seven and under that are mm-hmm. not relevant to the actual athleticism of what is high performance. Yeah, you and I have talked about you can play the best game of your life and lose. Oh, totally. That's the reality of sports. That's the humbling part of sports. Yeah, is that that's why there's underdog <laughs> stories. That's why you have like you have to value effort. Mm -hmm. You have to value passion. You have to value growth. Mm -hmm. All of those things far beyond they, the the value of those is goes a thousand times beyond um, the end result or the stats that make up the end result. And we forget that too often. The value of failure. Oh man. Learning how to fail. Could you, I, if I learned that When I was younger, if somebody said to me, when you lose this game, when you get cut from this team, Mm -hmm. you know, all you hear is, oh, (laughs) brutal. You didn't make it, whatever. And one of the hardest situations I've ever been through is getting cut from Hockey Canada Mm -hmm. because that was my value system. Yep. That was what I valued. Mm -hmm. You aren't good unless you play on Hockey Canada Mm -hmm. and you get cut from that team and your identity is gone. And then it's like, holy man, you experience loss of identity, failure, um, letting people down. You Mm -hmm. experience all these things all in one super fun plane ride home. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, okay. And now when I look back on it, it was the greatest lesson in my life. But I... I had to learn that through a lot of hard, hard, hard years after, right? Yeah. And it's, so that's why when we we talk about coaching our team and 
things like that, the first thing we said was, we don't care about goals. We don't care about points. We don't care about this. We care about who you are. Mm -hmm. We care about how you value yourself. You know, like the yeah, things that really treat matter. Your teammates, how, how you, you treat, treat your opponents. Yeah. All the your things. Your level that. of confidence, your desire to be here. Are you having fun? Mm -hmm. If we don't check those boxes, what is the point of the rest? Right. So... Today, uh, having the pleasure of talking with Dr. Too Good and hearing, you know, like sh the, the cool thing with her is like you were mentioning in the beginning, like a lifetime worth of experiences, mm -hmm. like working with grassroots, incorporating it with her own kids. Oh, yeah, let's skedaddle over to the CFL. OK, let's talk about a tennis study. You know, there's mental health is within every single one of us and the the fact that we're not talking about it more consistently within athletes is crazy. Yeah, I, I was a sick kid. Not I, I grew up in, in doctor's offices and hospitals. I've had an autoimmune disease since I was 10. And there's <clears throat> been a few times in my life where people didn't get it because I don't look like a sick person. You, my disease is very much on the inside of me. I look the same whether I feel great or whether I feel like an absolute sack of garbage. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very easy conversation for me to have around medication and doctors and the cycle of that and man am i grateful for that and that's what we need to to normalize and achieve when it comes to mental health yeah is it being equally as okay or comfortable for someone who is struggling like i do lots to just talk about it yeah and you've spoken a lot on this too is we are so easy to be okay when someone's physically, visibly hurt. Mm -hmm. Like someone's got a broken arm. Everybody is around yeah. them. Everybody is like, hey, we've got you. We got you on this plan, blah, blah, blah. You say, hey, I have anxiety. Yeah. So, so, so does that mean you're not coming today? Yeah. So are you good? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's, it's a total, and, and I know you've experienced that too. Like it's we we have to get better at learning and it is a learning curve we have to implement it a lot with grassroots and it should be a part of the requirements to be a coach in my opinion mm -hmm. um learning about body language the way kids speak when um they're they're looking at you you are in an authoritative position they are telling you something without telling you something yes. with their body language right and mm -hmm. it's so f this conversation needs to happen a lot more. Yeah. And I, I would challenge, we've done this. We've, mm -hmm. I've quietly challenged people on through the course of our episodes to think about how you speak to people, actively listen, um, listen to, like you say, people's body language, understand that kids who you coach are going to tell you what you want to hear, but they do have another message just in general, treating humans with a, a sense of humanity and kindness. So we're going to continue to talk about it over the course of upcoming episodes of Beauties. But today was, I think, a really important and really impactful episode. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was th exactly that. And the one thing, too, um, that I am very excited about is when we get into um, the Beers with Beauties episodes where mm -hmm. we bring in athletes and we bring in parents and we bring in all these people to have real conversations about things. And I guarantee you every single athlete that'll come in will have a story about, Ooh. you know what I mean? I every yep. single athlete will come in and, you know, and parent, everybody will have their story about how, um, you know, maybe it was a parent getting too overwhelmed in certain situations, or maybe it was, um, athletes you know that go through this really dark period when their their playing is over because their whole identity has been on playing mm -hmm. and now there's nothing there for them you know like i think that th the beers with beauties is going to be a very well it's going to be fun but it's going to be it's <laughs> going to shine a lot of lights on how this truly does affect every single human being yeah sports included or excluded yeah so with that being said um Thank you again, Dr. Tugood, for coming on today. And I hope everybody enjoys our ep episode with Dr. Tugood. Well, this week at the Beauty Sports Desk, there's a lot going on in the world, but when it's Mental Health Week and in some places Mental Health Awareness Month, yep. we thought it would be amazing to bring on 
Dr. Leslie Tuga to the Beauty Sports Desk. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much for coming on with us today. Um, for the people who may not know you or uh, haven't heard of you before, which in Winnipeg, Manitoba is kind of hard. Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> Give us a little uh, snapshot of who you are and what you do. Um, sure. Um, my name is Adrian, and uh, I think I've been in, uh, embedded in sport for pretty much my whole life. It was a huge part of my life growing up. Uh, so I think what I do is I... It's been interesting. I lived in the United States for a number of years and came back up to Canada. And from the time I arrived, I've always been just um, really adamant that if you want to be the best you can be at something and challenge your limits, you have to be physically well, but you also have to be mentally well. And I think initially when I started to have that conversation, it was uh, confusing for people. And I was a little ahead of the curve in terms of where we were at as a society culture, especially in high performance sport and especially in some sports where there might not be as open as much openness to it. But I just uh, was so passionate about it. And I'm so happy the world's starting to catch up with that. But um, I really my mantra that I talk a lot about right now is I try to create uh, human first brave spaces. So I've done a lot of EDI kind of work. I led a national sport organization through some work in that area. And there was a safe sport presenter. And they said that, you know, gosh, I don't know if I can create safe spaces. I don't know if it's going to be safe, but I can certainly do all I can to create a brave space. You can bring your whole self into it, you know, and I'm like, oh, I love that. So I stole it. Um, and then I've always been a human first person, you know, <laughs> and um, I think as a society now, we're starting to say things like, um, you know, it's OK. It's OK to not be OK. And for me, I'm like, OK, OK, it's not quite there and so where I sit now because I've sort of thought about it a lot is that um, yeah for sure it's okay to not be okay but I think like you know you're born into this world you probably are going to get sick sometimes or injured sometimes your body's going to be broken up and banged up especially if you're pushing your limits and you know what when you come into this world you're probably going to be mentally unwell at times too you're going to sometimes get mentally ill um, but you're also just going to have some mental health challenges along the way otherwise you're probably not leading a super fulfilling life so the, the challenge um, in high performance environments where you're trying to get people to push their limit is I think we have to sit here and accept that we're going to experience negative affect. We're going to struggle. Um, literally just before this, I was on the call with a, uh, with a professional golfer and we were chatting and you know, that's a, t a tough slog. And if you miss a few cuts, you're not feeling so great about things, you know? And um, I did this really interesting research. This will be my last thing. Then I'll stop. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, years ago I was doing this research study with team Canada volleyball uh, with the women's team actually. And um, I had the vid the coaches create videos of all their errors. So in volleyball, you tag everything, you know, that's a zero, you know? So I'm like, I'll oh, give me all the zeros. And then I sat people down and I put virtual reality glasses on them. I made them watch their zeros and I attached them to the basically biofeedback quick equipment so I could see their psychophysiology. And for Adrian, it was like, Oh, what's happening? Because the star player, the player, the coach loved because she was a hundred percent invested. She sucked at it. Like she watched her errors and she was just a mess inside of herself. And I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> then I attached this one player who the coaches hated because you know what? She was not invested. She didn't care. It wasn't her life and she was great at it. And then I thought more about it over the next few days. Cause that's what I often do is I sort of think about these things. And I was like, huh, that's so interesting. So the athlete that was the most invested, they're not going to show it on the outside, but you know what? On the inside, they're hurting, they're in pain, they're struggling because they care. So my pro golfer I was talking about is saying, Hey, if you're going to invest fully in something, if you really want it right now, then, you know, from a mental health standpoint, we're going to have to work harder to keep you well. Because if you didn't care and you didn't have sponsors all over your shirts, you probably wouldn't care if you screwed it up and missed a cut. But now you do care. So that's the thing we have to be careful about with these athletes is the more they care. And now we're asking them to care from a really young age because they're invested in academies and they're working really hard. And we might not want to, but when they care young and when they have all the attributes that everyone likes, they're actually at higher risk for mental health challenges along the way. Um, the best athletes are super perfectionist. They're super obsessed. They're passionate about it and they love it. Unbelievable. We need those qualities for them to become great, but that's a risk factor for mental health. So anyways, there's so much I could say, but I'm realizing I've been talking for a while. So I'll stop <laughs> and you let me know what your thoughts are. No. And what an incredible intro just for the fact of this has been a lifelong mission for you and the amount of experiences mm -hmm. that you've had with not only high, high, high performance athletes, but you know, now you're talking about players that are just getting into it and recognizing those warning signs right away that of like, when you have these attributes as a young kid, now we know that it, it could lead to something potentially down the road. But I think a lot of parents too right now are wondering about like... <laughs> 
with COVID, obviously, I'm sure you've had this conversation a couple times. What has been, has there been any key changes mm-hmm. in the conversations that you've had with athletes during this two year period? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Uh, it's hard for me. I'm just trying to think COVID's had so many waves to it. <laughs> I'm like, which wave? No, um, I think true. everyone's Very been differentially true. affected. And I think that's something, <laughs> you know, something we have to just, um, to recognize and admit it would depend like if an athlete's more introverted versus extroverted, it might depend on where they are in, in their season or their sport. Or, you know, I think that, um, that's one of the reasons I mentioned at the beginning that, um, you know, I started a podcast called Heroes in the Midst and why I started it was because I think as a, a culture and, uh, you know, in, in in our world, we are questioning the role of and the value of sport because that's just something you do. That's just fun. Like we, who knows? And mm-hmm. meanwhile, when I sit in my office, I meet these unbelievable human beings that have been transformed through sport and, and make huge contributions to our world. And so I just wanted their voices to be out there. And so I think in general, we've just been like, uh. and if you want to talk in girls in sport, I was on a panel through uh, Sport Manitoba through their lead hership series. And um, you ladies might mm-hmm. have been on that as well at some time, but mm-hmm. um, Sarah Orleski was kind of moderating the panel and they were just talking about about how one of the real the one of the statistics they're really concerned about is they've done research and they've said to girls you know are you going to return to sport after covid and really high numbers of girls said no and um there wasn't as much discrepancy on the male side and so that's like really sad and and it's tough i guess for me i could talk in in so many ways about um the impact of covid but just the difference between girls in sport and boys in sport you know and um there's just so many more opportunities for the boys to keep playing and participating and even if they have families they can keep going because it's cool to be married to a professional sport guy it's not as cool to be married to a professional sport girl and she doesn't make enough money to feed the family you know so it's tough you know there's lots of choices that that women have to make and so the only reason I'm talking about that in the context and lens of COVID is I think there's implications for that. For boys, there's still opportunity to play professionally, et cetera. I think the girls question the value of sport in their lives, you know, a little bit more. And, well, it's just sport or why or they get doing other things. And But sport's incredibly valuable, you know, and I think we have to we have to remember that. That was one of the biggest things that I wanted to talk about because a lot of people are finding that their sense of value as a parent is different with their daughter and son as well, too. And we've talked about that before, mm, good one. Um, you know, working together. Am I lagging? Hmm. Tell me more about what you mean by that. I need to be reminded of the conversation. Oh, oh okay. I was like, am I lagging or <laughs> um, when we were no, like... Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, the sense of value um, that girls get from sports and how it differentiates from societal pressure and why it's so important to have female coaches in there to re and, and encourage them to be like, these are your pathways. These can happen because men hear it consistently. Boys hear that conversation all the time. Okay, well, stay on this path because you're going to go to the chow. You're going to go here where girls, it's like, well, I guess you can go to midget or like there's nobody being like, you can go to the PHF or the PWHPA or you can go overseas like constantly in their ear. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, and I would almost... (laughs) my brain would kind of it's splitting in two directions right now in terms of possibilities. But um, one of the possibilities too, is that it's not even where you go. It's the value you get and how you change as a person by challenging your limits and being the best version of yourself. And I see too many young women who step off the path too soon. And there's stuff you learn about yourself when you try and be your best at something and you challenge yourself and you learn how to deal with failure and you deal with the really tough stuff. And so it's about kind of playing at a level that really challenges the limits of who you are. And that's a gift, right? It's a gift to actually really push yourself to be your best. And so that's the thing that I think is so important. And um, maybe too many uh, young girls aren't, you know, don't have that opportunity to do that. So when I think of that, I think of as parents, we need to think more about what role sports playing in their life and um, why we want them to do those things. You know, it's not just to play in that league, but it's because, she's good enough to play in that league and that will push her limits and help her to be the best version of herself. And she's going to learn a ton about herself as a human being and she'll live her life differently if she does that. You know, to me, that's the value of really pushing your limits and um, the value that sport can play in the lives of these young women. And when I think about too, when I think about the societal push, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of the fire pole study uh, where they took a group of kids I to a fire so hall. Share it with me. Okay, uh, they took a group of kids to the f- a fire hall, and they said, you know, slide down the pole. It's the best part about going to a fire hall is sliding down a pole, and 
the boys were encouraged to be fearless, to jump, to, to go all the way in. Don't think about it for a second. Jump off that thing. And every single girl in the study was, are you sure? Are you, do you want me to go to the bottom? Do you want me to make sure you're okay at the bottom? And the conversation changed mm. for those kids in that situation. And I truly believe that that happens all throughout, um, you know, girls career just because of societal pressures. You get into a certain situation where a girl's deciding if she wants to go overseas or if she wants to stay at home. And get it's like, well, have kids. well, mm. uh, you, you went to school, you got to get a real job. You need an education. You've got to get a real job right away as soon as possible. And, you know, Cowie and I can speak to this because it was the conversation that was said to us. And now it's like, Every chance I get to tell a female athlete to, to be fearless, go out and try new things, go out and experience the world and fail and be okay with it and, you know, embrace that kind of culture. I think that one of the things we are missing big time in the, you know, aspect of, of imp implementing that with younger girls is that we're not talking about it enough when they're younger. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot there. And I think that what's interesting <laughs> is, you know, having it's important to have these conversations in this space. And it's not like we're going to solve things today, but I can um, honestly say, and I'm just going to pause for one second because you're both frozen. Okay, you're back. That's good. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. So we're having this conversation on Mother's Day and I have two children. And I remember when my children were very young and this happened on the same day. So I couldn't deny that it happened. And my son, who's a very competitive little guy, you know, his friend invited him to like try gymnastics day, you know, and so he got invited and he went and tried gymnastics for the day. And so it's all these kids who have never done it. So they're setting them up and they're doing like relay courses and things like that. And um, he, again, he's a very competitive little guy. So he was on his little relay team and his little relay team was not, you know, they were kind of in second place. And so he just pretty much almost killed himself so that his little relay team could win. And then I was watching and I'm like, oh, and then he became like a hero of the little group of dudes. You know, the little guys are like, oh, you go in front of me, River, and here's a glass of water, River. And they were like treating him so positively. Now, what happened to my daughter the same day? was she had come home from school and I just noticed she wasn't looking too peppy. And so, you know, it takes a while, you know, and throughout the day I'm like, oh, what's happening? And then it was at night and she finally was chatting to me about it. And she said, well, you know, yesterday I was at school and I guess at lunchtime or in phys ed class or something, they were running laps or something in the gym. And she's a very good little athlete. And I guess there was another little girl in the class that Maddie was running faster than. And so that little girl the next day at lunchtime told no one to eat with her because they said that she wasn't nice and she was mean to her. And so then I, with her, was having a conversation about um, kind of friends in kindergarten, I think it was. And I was like, okay, well, here's the deal. If you want to wait for someone, you wait for them for sure. But never wait for them because you think they'll be your friend because they're not your friend. You know, and I was having this boundary conversation with her. And so I was like, okay, so right. if Maddie pushes her limits, she loses all the friends that she has. And if River pushes him li his limits, he becomes a hero. I'm like, hmm, interesting. So that's the other piece, too, is I do think that women are socialized very differently. And you would have a tough time convincing me otherwise, because, again, it was the same day. And I watched it. And I watched it with both of my children. And with both of my children, um, you know, I've obviously, you know, I'm aware of this. And I've really tried to create um, opportunity. And I'm very careful the way I talk to my children. But that's where, as a parent, too, how you talk to your children is very important. Um, you know, there's a really interesting study in math where they had kids in a classroom and they reinforced half of the classroom for effort. So things like, wow, Addie, I saw you were working really hard. That's awesome. Great job, Addie. And, you know, Cowie, they reinforced the other half of the class for outcome. And it's very subtle, but they said, oh my gosh, Cowie, you only got two wrong. That's awesome. Way to go. The next day, the kids came back to the class and they had an option to pick which test they wanted to do. One was a lot harder than the other one. The kids who were reinforced for effort chose the harder test. And here's the interesting part. They also made less errors on that test. So it's really interesting, right? And so for me, I link a lot of this wow. back to mental health and even things like flow state, you know, and that um, we know that flow state happens when people are at a place where the limits of their capacity, the, the life is giving them the opportunity to do things at the limit of their capacity. So it's like you're in that zone of really oh my gosh I'm getting it like you're just at the edge of what you can do and you have that opportunity to do it and because we socialize people and especially girls to be safe 
there there's less opportunity. You know, we're we're really socializing a dysthymic kind of culture and existence that way because we know true joy comes from really pushing your limits. Interesting timing of this as well. Um, there's an author named Susan Cain who just published a book. And it's called Bittersweet. I was like, what's it called? But I, it's like over there. So I was going to look, but I figured it out. It's bittersweet. And it's really <laughs> about um, really this idea of the mental health continuum. I've sort of, I've, I've modified it a lot. And right now I have it as three, the three primary colors of, of red, green, and blue. Cause RGB is what all the colors in the world are made of. And it's this idea of, um, you know, again, the spectrum of emotion. And that's what the bittersweet book about is about as well. And it's this idea that if we want to live fully, we have to be willing to experience the, the emotions we consider negative in our culture, you know. And so um, the other thing, too, if we think of girls is they might express that in a way where they might cry. And that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. And we say, well, like, oh, my God, they're crying. They're not tough. And I can tell you, honestly, that the toughest people I know, they they cry, they let it go, they move on and they, they, they kill it the next time, you know. So, again, so I think there's a complexity to it. Um, um, there's a lot in there that, um, you know, obviously I, I, I work a lot in the mental health I, part of it, but um, in the other parts as well. Yeah, the, the society pieces that you mentioned, like I had just triggered a, a, a memory for me, I guess, from university. And I remember and I've always been um, a fairly outgoing person. I am very much a call a spade a spade every single time. Um, and I, I, I say it all the time that I think we only grow when we're uncomfortable and myself included, like I'll put myself in situations that, that allow me to do that. And I remember sitting, it was a macroeconomics class in university. And my professor actually said to me that I was going to do great things in this world because of my masculine qualities. And you kind of sit mm -hmm. on that as a university kid and go, what, <laughs> what does that even? And it's like, I know yeah. he meant it in a, in a complimentary way. But mm -hmm. I digested it and I remember <laughs> phoning my mom and being like, I don't know how to unpack that. I don't know how to, I don't know if that is <laughs> like a positive or a negative or what, but it is obviously this systemic culture that we have of the ways that we treat and view masculine or, or feminine. And when someone crosses those boundaries and how confusing that can be and, and, and how we associate success with masculinity was just... Yeah, I was like, oh, what a blow. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, too, because of the time we're having this conversation, when you look at the literature right now, and places of work right now, when they're actually looking at leadership a lot. And honestly, the the attributes that are most valued now are more the feminine qualities. But why do we even call them masculine or feminine? Exactly. But, um, really, the world of work, right? The world of work right now is that... Um, you know, people want to be shown, like, if you want to keep the best employees, then you better show them you care about them, you know, and you better help them find purpose and meaning. Otherwise, they're leaving your place of work because that's just where we're at right now. And so, um, yeah. you know, it's really interesting. But that's where, yeah, and that's a position, too, where that's someone in more power than you saying that. And again, how cool is it? Like, imagine if we raised women to kind of pay attention to their voice, pay attention to what they're thinking about things and um, trust what they what they they hear, you know, and that, that's a big mm -hmm. part of it too. So I just think as parents and adults, um, and you know, we need to have uh, intentionality one, one around One thing that I just wanted to jump in. You know, it's subtle. It's yeah. Oh, no, you <laughs> sorry. You were finishing your sentence. Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. You guys froze for a second. So I didn't really know <laughs> kind of if you were still with me or not anyways. No. Um, <laughs> but, um, I think that, um, yeah, no, um, you know, there's obviously been a lot written about kind of growth mindsets type of things, but the way we talk to kids, especially as parents, can be really important, you know, and um, if, yeah, I know my daughter, again, she was a competitive gymnast growing up, um, and, you know, I was very careful, to, didn't matter if it was the best or the worst competition of her life, and in gymnastics trust me, you fall off apparatus and that there go your chances, right? It happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time I, I was always the same parent, I responded to her in the exact same way. Um, yeah. I didn't want her to um, get differential treatment from me based on how she performed because I wanted her to learn to not differentially treat herself based on how she performed. Um, you know, and there are times where I, I uh, there was one time in particular, I remember where I did not follow my own rules. Um, and so we had a competition where we fell off the beam as well as the bars. So I felt that on the car ride home, maybe I would, you know, talk to her about that a little bit, just like, Oh, what's happening? Da, da, da. And I could tell that this did not go over well. Um, and so the next day I apologized to her because I didn't want her 
to, um, yeah, I wanted her to have the freedom to fail. As she said, I wanted her to have freedom to like, because that's where that's, that's our edge. That's where we love life the most. And yeah. I think that's incredibly important. And I can talk to you about both of my children as a parent, how I'm very cautious the way I talk to them so that I can shape the opportunities for them to try and be great at whatever they're trying to do. And I think that this conversation is so great from a parent perspective. And it's truly something I believe we have to start having more at a coaching perspective as well. Like I've always lived by, um, you know, girls need to be respected to feel comfortable when they compete and boys compete to be respected. And we really need to start embracing that within mm -hmm. helping our coaches understand that just because say you're a a coach of a boys team, you can just go and coach girls, I think is so old and it needs to move on. And like you're saying with the, the conversations that you're having with your kids, the conversations that your coaches have follow you through your entire career. So, Absolutely. so say if like a, a parent is listening with a kid that's 10 and under right now, is there any advice that you would give them just on, you know, the the famous car ride home or you know any type of uh, you know situation <laughs> that you can be in to you know really be cautious of those conversations because i i 100 percent believe they follow you for your lifetime in sport yeah no i agree i think that um yeah, there's so many directions that you could take that, but definitely I'll, I'll think I'll start, I think, with a study that was done in the sport of tennis, which is a high investment sport, a lot of parent involvement and so a lot of parent presence. And initially when they conducted the research, they felt that the um, the parents that were there most, there was, those are the parents that were going to be a problem. But what they found was that it was actually other things. So one of the things that the kids said, it was a qualitative study. They said that basically... Um, you know, we want the coaches to coach and we want the parent to be a parent. They don't, even if you come from the sport, they really don't want technical feedback and correction from their parent. Um, they want their parent to, you know, make their meals for them and, you know, show up and pick them up, logistics kind of stuff. The other thing that was really interesting, they commented on the body language of parents and they said, hey, parent, you know, I can see you in the stands and I can tell if you're struggling up there and that doesn't help me out. Um, and they just really, at the, the end of the day, um, kids want unconditional acceptance from their parent. And so they don't want the conversation to be different uh, based on how they played. And so if they had a great day or a tough day, they need the same love and the same care. And, you know, there's something, well, I could just go on about, about just that part for so long. You know, there's um, a guy sure. named Carl Rogers, um, who is very known for his humanistic existential kind of work, but um, he just talked about kind of um, his three core conditions and, you know, it was really how do you create a space so that people can, you know, bring their full self and, you know, um, those core conditions, I think, fit for a lot of things in terms of, um, you know, just giving your kid the space. Because here's the bottom line. I bet the, I bet your kid tried their, their very hardest today and they need to have the space to kind of figure out how to do it better because you're not going to gonna be able to hop onto the court or onto the ice. You know, they need to figure it out. And so whatever happened out there, it's all part of their story. And I'm. I'm a big believer, you know, one of the, the books I often talk to people about is The Velveteen Rabbit, <laughs> you know, but it's really about the story of becoming. And I think the sport journey is just a whole, um, it's all about the, this, this young person's journey to become. And, you know, you have to recognize your, your role in helping to shape that experience for them. Um, at the end of the day, too, you definitely want to focus on the things your kid can control. Your kids can't control ice time. Your kids can't control uh, so many things, you know. Um, my kids, um, my son is a goalie, um, so another tough sport. Um, but, uh, you know, with him, <laughs> my, um, I honestly had to work with my husband a little. No, just kidding. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm super... Um, I'm super, I'm super pumped for my, for my son in terms of the environment he's able to, uh, to, being able to grow up in, because I think he has a privilege to, you know, really fight hard in big moments and show up for those and not be scared and sink into the net because we've always, doesn't matter what happened. I remember this one time when he's playing double A's 11 years old or maybe 12. I can't remember how old they are back then, but. Um, we were in uh, the playoffs, final round, we're in the finals, you know, everyone's all like, I can't even tell you, I wish I videotaped some of the emotion in that because I was like, wow, these parents are losing their sanity. Okay. Um, yeah. But anyways, we ended up losing like <laughs> two, one or something. And it was like, it was like their best player went from one end of the ice to the other end of the ice and like top shelved it over my son. And, you know, we lose the game two one. 
And I think a lot of goalie parents would get to the car and they'd be like, what the hell was the defense doing? Bleh! And my husband, my son comes to the car and he says, okay, what could, what could you have done? Yeah. You got to come out and challenge the shooter, right? Awesome. That's the way we've talked to my son his whole life is what can he do? How can he get better? How can he embrace the opportunity to improve? Not like what the hell were the defense doing? The coaches should have played you. He was also undersized and, um, so, you know, sometimes he, he's always had to work harder to get himself in the net, especially in playoffs. We've yeah. always said, OK, you know, work harder in practice. You work harder in practice. So, right. you know, we have to be so tough the way we talk to them. In terms of what you said about coaches, though, that's huge because here's the other part. There's a lot of judginess usually. If I come from the guys game and the woman, as you said, they need to feel cared for, et cetera, to perform. Then it's like they're soft, they're weak. And, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, that's why my, you know, mental health for performance. It's like, so do you want performance? Cool. Okay. Well, then let's figure this out. You can judge it all you want. You can call it all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, they're not performing for you. So why don't we figure out how to get the most out of them? Okay. Why don't we do this? Um, but yeah, I think it's so important. I'm hopeful that now with COVID and we're looking at leaders everywhere and, you know, with social media and EDI and all that stuff happening, I'm hopeful that maybe we're going to be forced to look at things and really create spaces where we can um, accept the people in the room and we can talk about it. But at the end of the day, how you perform is a function of all your technical and physical skill times the humanity, you know, and um, you have to help people figure out that piece too, if you want them to be the best version of themselves out there. So Adrian, I, uh question for you because i think this is something obviously your household you're you're a good resource and that you spend your life in this and you're constantly digging to evolve and grow and learn and and educate yourself and those around you and i think i i'm speaking really from my own life experience but what i see through uh you know friends with kids and now coaching my wife coaches um i think one of the things is I'm not sure that as a society, we have a really strong understanding of if we have a kid or if our household, if a parent is struggling of understanding how to deal with a you know high, high performing athlete who they think may be struggling with their mental health, or if a, an athlete or a student athlete is struggling, um, can you give us from your chair what your advice would be to an athlete or a parent of where they can go or where they can find resources to help? Yeah, there's actually a um, if if kids are really struggling, um, I you know because I was gonna say at first you need to you need to be open to to looking, and I think even looking at the world through a different lens. I use words like emotional injury a lot, right? And so if you see, so if my kid is uh, playing and he gets lit up, or he ends up having a tough day you know what? He probably has an emotional injury, you know, and imagine physical injuries. We don't have a problem noticing them. We're just like, Oh wow. Addie's ankle's a little sore. Let's get that taken care of. No big deal. The emotional injuries were more, were more hesitant to see. And, you know, there's a, a great resource, um, uh, called do it for Darren, which comes out of tragedy, you know, and these are parents who lost their child to suicide. And they said, you know what? We didn't see it. And we didn't want to see it because we didn't want to know our kid was hurting. And so we, we didn't see it. And now we don't have a kid. And so their whole thing is they want to try and create opportunities to have conversations. So it's not a big deal. We have good days. We have bad days. We have tendencies that help us or, or don't, you know. And so I think we need to take start taking more of um, a non-judgmental um, and open standpoint towards towards noticing. So I guess I'd respond in lots of ways. I think that when we're in crisis, that's the toughest time to start the conversation. So imagine if you kind of created an opportunity. I think when kids are growing up too, they... I think it takes a village to raise a child. You as a parent might not be the person that they necessarily love, love to talk to, but maybe they have a great coach they love to talk to. So I think first get your, your kid involved and, and get them to have lots of awesome adults in their life that can help to raise your child that they might feel more comfortable talking to. And if your kid's having a tough day and you know you're they're not the person to talk to, you know, try and get that aunt or, or coach or someone to like connect with them because you can tell they're having a rough day. Um, we really get into trouble when we notice, um, changes to basic behaviors. So their sleeping patterns are changing. They're not doing as well academically. They're not taking care of themselves. That's when it's like, gosh, the struggle's real. This, this is tough. Um, I think too, the biggest thing is we also, cause top down perspective, we have more power in that, that kid's life. We have to look at, um, how we feel about some of this stuff. Um, what did we learn about mental health growing up in sport and other places? 
we have to be more open to kind of our messaging around it. And we have to understand that so that we can normalize a conversation with any kid that's in our life, right? We have to, we have to normalize it. And that's why my big thing is mental health for performance. We need mental health. Like I'm a strong believer and that's where we're, we're not really sure what to do with mental health. Um, but um, you have to perform. You have to feel like you're contributing and getting better to be mentally well. Um, and you have to be mentally well in order to perform, you know, so they're not separate for me. And you know, it's just, it's the, it's life, you know, and <clears throat> you're going to have bad days. You're going to have good days. And, um, that's why I also love the idea of a mental health continuum. I need to drink water. Go on. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. And so even, even to continue off on that, because we've been talking a lot about, you know, children and households, but you know, what sparked the conversation of us reaching out to you and having this conversation <clears throat> is because of, we're hearing these tragic stories coming out of NCAA of where these kids, these athletes feel like they there's no other option for them. There's no other way out. And I feel like that's a combination of, you know, they don't want to let people down. They don't want to, you know, they, there's a lot of different situations, but I feel like there's a conversation here too of like, how do you support your kid once they've gotten past, you know, living in your house, mm -hmm you know, supporting an athlete once, you know, of yeah. you've gone off to university or even, you know, gone pro. And I know you've worked with a lot of pro female athletes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, there's definitely a lot of complexity to it. I love that you're, you're thinking about that. And I think that's the first thing is, yeah, how do I, how do I support my, my child? How do I stay connected to them? How do I know that they're loved, even when it's a tough day? How do I, how do I help them understand um, that there are other options, especially, you know, some of the student athlete situations we're looking at. Um, a lot of times there was complexity that entered some of these athletes lives where maybe they didn't get a great grade, or maybe they're getting, you know, they're, they're kind of people who've had perfect lives up until now. Now that now they might've made a mistake and they couldn't handle the weight of making that mistake yet. You know, if we go back to the Velveteen Rabbit, that's part of what happens in life. And that's part of our process of becoming. And how do we help them understand that um, this is part of the fabric of, of their life and who they are? Um, so I do think that, and I know that uh, you ladies are coaching a team now and you come from that coaching background. And I can honestly say, I, I, as you mentioned, I work with a lot of teams and I work with a lot of really, you know, high level teams that people would respect. And, um, you know, I, I had a meeting with the coaches of um, a team that was entering the playoffs. That's, uh, you know, a very talented team. And it was all around mental health. And I told them that if you want a competitive advantage, I can guarantee that not every other team in your league is sitting down and having a conversation about how to keep people mentally well through this process and how to deal with emotional injuries, etc. You know, and for me, I said to them, you're going to have mental health challenges. If you have a kid who's getting healthy scratch, if you have a kid who's not getting playing time that they want, they're going to be more, more likely they're going to have mental health challenges. You're going to see that. So I'm like, see it, see it, talk to the kid, help the kid out, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. that's that culture of caring. You know, if you create that, you know, then, um, you know, if we create that culture of caring can, can connection, cause it's just tough, right? There's that cocktail. So these are often the very best kids that will make this decision because they're, they're perfect and they don't want to let people down. Right. And it's not like you're asking them to carry the weight of those expectations, but they do naturally. That's what makes them so great. So sometimes the qualities mm -hmm. that make them great make them the most vulnerable for this stuff, this stuff. And we have to see it. We have to start seeing it. We have to start understanding it and helping keep these, you know, these kids safe. Um, so I think it's really important as parents to be honest to yourself about how your kid's wired because how do you keep in touch? And I'm someone who can live that. My daughter left for university last year and I was wondering yeah how do I do that anyways and she's a pretty intense like uh, um, to be honest like she's just an awesome kid like she's got such a great head on her shoulders and makes her decisions but I, I definitely you know she's a kid who's always done well and I'm like okay I don't know how this will go but I want her to know that um, you know if it doesn't go well that's okay like you know and so for me um, there's another coach that had um, that was out and she went to Dalhousie so was out in the Maritimes and she was a swim coach but she went away for university and so she said to me hey send her some letters like write her some stuff I love getting mail so I'm like all right so that's you know what it was interesting I was like how do I stay connected how do I she's a super independent kid that doesn't need anything but I want her to know that I'm here you know what do I do and so I did I went out and then it kind of grew right. and I'm like oh I'm gonna buy some nice cards oh I'm gonna look and I went on Amazon and I bought like these little like stickers and uh, you know so I found different things that I can mail to her you know and I'm like okay 
Um, so I just wanted to stay connected in that way. So every kid's different in terms of what they need. One of the things that I struggled with my daughter, she's very different than I am. I'm a super intense person. I'm really in your face. She's quite quiet. She reads a lot and I'm too much for her sometimes, you know? And so again, you have to, I've had to work to give her space and look at what she needs as opposed to what I want to give her, you know? And so I think that's a big thing as a parent and as a coach as well. And so imagine if every coach you know, look at all the testing we do physically for athletes. That's right. Where, you know, we look at, sometimes we do screens to see about their, their body. We watch them technically. When's the last time you thought about, hmm, how does that kid respond to failure? How do they respond to feedback? Um, you know, we, we don't spend much time looking at that inner landscape of how a kid's dealing with that. That's what I love about psychophysiology and biofeedback, because I can show you on a screen how they're reacting to that. You know, I can show you how deeply they care and what tools do we have in place to help them manage some of that stuff. And so, you know, we all do a great job of masking stuff on the outside. But yeah, what does that kid need from me to be their best? What does that need, kid need from me? Not when it's good. And one of my colleagues, um, he works down in the States. He works at, uh, I think he was at Brigham Young, actually, mm -hmm. which is irrelevant to this conversation, <laughs> but whatever. Um, anyways, um, he was doing a presentation on kind of injury rehabilitation stuff. And the comment he made was that, I don't really care what the kid says to me when I'm in my office, right? I'm always thinking about what's that kid saying to themselves when they're alone in their room. Wow. Yep. And I'm like, ooh, that's a powerful way to think about it, right? And so the kid, and that's the other thing too with coaches, right? Kids are always going to tell you what they want to hear, and they're always going to like put on a brave face. How do you, again, create that brave space where you get the truth about how the kid's feeling about that thing? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes more time to create that kind of relationship, which I know you've created with your athletes, right? It does. It takes more time. But that's when yeah. you get like, that's when you get greatness, right? Is when you create the space and you really figure out and the kid knows they're not dealing with that alone. Um, there's so many great examples of um, people talking now about things, whether it's, you know, Naomi Osaka or Kevin Love or, you know, there's just so many great examples of people talking about this stuff now. Um, but, you know, mastering sport and becoming your best is partly the physicality part about it, but it's partly also that, that, that emotional part too, and managing yourself when you fail. It's not, it's not a judgment thing. It's not like, oh my God, I'm really hard on myself. That sucks. You know, it's like, no, it's like, that's the way I am. And if to be my best, I have to learn to manage that. And here's how I'm going to do it, you know? And imagine if we can create more of that, that same kind of, um, yeah, that, yeah. That same and kind of environment. Absolutely. And even, like that just hits like a ton of bricks when you say like, when's the last time we've like sat down and talked about our mental state as athletes or even, you know, you take it to the workplace, you know, anywhere. When do, when do we actually sit down yeah. and do a check on how are you doing? And I think that that's a, such a valuable lesson, not only in sport for parents, for coaches, but for life. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And so, mm -hmm. um, I feel like we could go on for ever about this kind of stuff. And we do want to, you know, we appreciate your time and we want to be respectful of your time. So um, I know you were mentioning that you've got a couple podcasts coming up and stuff. So can you please let our listeners know where they can find you and how they can connect with you? Absolutely. I'm not sure when this is being, uh, when this is being dropped, but, uh, I've over the COVID period, I did start a podcast called heroes in our midst and it's um, unbelievable. Just, um, it's people's life stories because I really believe it goes back to Margaret Lawrence was a Canadian author and she was interviewed once and they said, wow, like your books are just about like people you'd sit with on the bus. And she was like, wow, if you're not kind of recognizing the value in every human being, then you're really missing out on a lot of your life, you know, and everyone has incredible stories and we can learn from everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's unbelievable. And then we're starting a new podcast. Uh, we're dropping our first one on June 1st called Mental Health for Performance and really trying to action some of the stuff and provide tools and strategies and demystify the conversation so we can normalize the idea that, yeah, you have to be mentally well and here's how you do it. No big deal, you know? Um, and it's really, that one is really directed towards leaders. So Mental Health Performance is very much directed towards leaders um, leaders and coaches. And the other one is dressed to war towards like athletes and parents, heroes in our midst. So um, we're actually redoing a few things right now. So by the end of um, this week, um, we're going to actually load them all onto my website, which is drtuga.com because right now we have them in a bunch of different places and that's a bit to manage. And so, you know, we're figuring it out, but yeah, <laughs> it's all going to be on drtuga.com and um, you know, at consult too good, I think is the social media handles we're working on. So um, they're all going to be there and they're going to be unreal. And it's really just, conversations to normalize humanity that's really what we're up to 
I love that. I, uh, yeah, you, you're a super insightful human being. I think everyone's going to learn something from this episode. <laughs> I know myself included. I appreciate your openness, candidness to talk about um, some of the things that I think as a culture we think are too hard to talk about. So I'm glad that we can do it in this space. And, and definitely we're going to continue to take that for, you know, where Addie and I coach and in our day to day lives. So thank you for being here. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks for all you got, you ladies are doing. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay. That there was so much in that episode. She she speaks so well on so many different topics. But the thing that stuck out for me was we have to see it. Yeah. We yeah. have to see it and acknowledge it. And yeah. If you're uncomfortable with it, well, it's a perfect time to get uncomfortable, right? <laughs> We've got yeah. to start seeing it and acknowledging it. Yeah, th I agree. Two things that stuck out to me were that and the term emotional injury. Oh, yeah. Which I thought, Jesus, if we could have just talked about it like that forever. <laughs> Yeah. How simple does that make it? How simple and... So you have an injury? Is it a physical or an emotional injury? Yeah. Oh, okay. Here's your resource. Here's your resource. Yeah. Physical, go to physio. Here's our sports psych or our, you know, therapist. Yeah. We need to talk it out. Let's talk it out. But let's actually classify uh, it, what it is. Yeah. It's some, an emotional injury. I, Jeez. Very good point, because we do tend to overcomplicate it once we put it under the category of mental health. As soon as it's something that we can't physically see and it goes in this direction, we over we we overcomplicate it. We just need to, okay, this is where we head. It's not like, and then you just get into the, the treatment of it. Yeah, and if we could, <clears throat> I mean, my, my brain went down a... a series of thoughts when she said those terms if we treated an emotional injury at the time of the emotional injury mm -hmm. versus doing nothing just like we treat if you block a shot or if you break a bone or if you twist a knee we don't just say here's the band-aid or here's the brace and suck it up we right. treat it if we treated an emotional injury if we have a kid on our team who is having a rough day and sits down for a shift and that creates an emotional injury. And if we can address that at the end of the game and explain it so they understand the purpose of or why and how we are together can repair or change the action that caused and they don't compound, we don't have compounding emotional injuries that then create systemic mental health issues. Yeah. Well, and to even double down on that, then that is why I feel like it is so important that we have coaches truly buy into the terminology of emotional injury. Ugh. Because if you have, we think about sports from so many different categories and there's so many different categories of coaches that we have in the world. And we're kind of narrowing in on coaches, obviously, because we're mainly talking about athletes. But when you're, when you are a coach, your words are so oh. impactful. Yeah. I can and remember. we and we can talk about this from so many different perspectives. But yep. when you just think about terminology alone, mm -hmm. it's uh, and then terminology alone. But then you have a coach that you know believes on being a bit harder, maybe pushing a little bit harder. Those coaches, we need to make sure that they loop back around and they get their touch points on their athletes to be like, okay, today was hard. Mm -hmm. I admit that. I was there. I was yeah. a part of it. How are you feeling about it? Because yeah. I needed X, Y, Z out of you. I didn't feel like that. And and open that conversation. Yeah. And I've had so many um, incredible coaches over my career. But the one thing that one of the best coaches I've ever had says to me is he's like, I'm not a coach. I'm a, I'm a speaker. I'm a communicator. I'm a, I know coaching. I know what I'm trying to coach, but if I'm not doing it in a way that fits an athlete, mm -hmm. I know to communicate differently. Mm -hmm. I'm a communicator. I'm not, I'm not a coach. And I was like, Oh, that to me stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I try to live that every Every time that I'm interacting with a girl, whether she is four or, you know, pr 
pro 25, 25 year old, yeah. right? It doesn't matter. So I think that uh, that emotional injury piece, we, we have to have buy-in from all avenues. We have to have buy-in, but we also need resources. Mm, you're right. We do. But we've got the likes of people like Dr. Tugood who are working on resources and ways and things like her podcasts. I mean, I am always excited to add a good podcast to my list. I uh, spend most of my time behind a steering wheel or when I vacuum or have a few minutes in my day with headphones in or when I drive just with my um, radio on, but it's never radio. It is a <laughs> podcast or audio book or something like that. So check out the resources um, and podcasts that she has because, yeah, I think you're right. It seems like a very easy thing to say mm -hmm. that we need buy-in, um, but we need a system to ask for or demand of. Yep. Yep. To get buy-in. Standard, for sure. No question about it. So today I think was a great stepping stone for us. And just like I mentioned off the top of the show, I'm excited um, about this because we're not shying away from it and we never will. And we're going to mm. attack it head on. And there will be more conversations like this at beauty sports because it's important and, yeah. um, uh, we believe in it and we will continue to chat about it. The hard conversations are honestly some of the most fulfilling. I, I, I couldn't agree more, yeah, but that's, that's personal, that's personal opinion only. Um, but I agree with you, buddy. This is oddly enough, which we haven't talked about yet. This is episode 25, which I think is a cool little milestone quarter, Whoa. quarter to a hundred and, and a great way to spend the 25th episode in talking about things that we need to continue to talk about as a, as a culture, as a community, as a society. So it was good. It was fun. And yeah. And I think it goes without saying that if, uh, you know, if you are an athlete that's listening to this and you do want to have conversations or you know of somebody that wants to have conversations, please look for resources that we've mentioned today. Um, reach out to us, reach out to anybody because we are, uh, we're all in this together. Um, no question about it. So to end this off, Cowie final words thank you for being here every one of you that has my voice right now in your ears we appreciate you my friend my ask to you Addie and I's ask to you is if you can go make sure to give us a like follow subscribe rate the podcast review it we know we see the stats that only half of you <laughs> actually follow the show so um, again for another 25th episode Addie I love you so much it's fun every week uh, we will see you on the next one thank you guys so much and we will see you next week